Welcome to the presentation for, this is actually module four, for the fall semester 2016. Care of the patient with cancer is actually module four for Nursing 150. This presentation will discuss um, the incidence of cancer cells, the difference between benign and metastatic cells, grading of tumors, um, classifications of cancer, definitions of cancer, cancer development, and risk factors for the development of cancer. The first few slides of this presentation are just um, specifically just to kind of review how cancer develops. These are just characteristics of normal cells. It's important to understand the characteristics of a normal cell in order to identify what makes a cell a cancerous cell. And the next couple slides kind of are some pictures that give you some visuals as to the difference between a normal cell and a cancerous cell. So this presentation is just a bit of a review. It's important to just kind of go back and review the characteristics of normal cells so that we can compare and contrast them with the cancer cells and what makes cancer cells what they are um, as opposed to being normal cells. Um, normal cells have a very specific morphology. They have a very specific purpose, which is this term differentiated function. Tight adherence, which means they stick to one another. Non-migratory means they don't wander off. So, for instance, cells that make skin will stay in the area to make skin, and they don't venture from that. They tightly adhere to other cells of their kind. They're orderly. They're well-regulated. There's a, this nice organization to the cells so that they can make a nice organ that functions normally. Again, this slide is just for a review of normal cell division, just talking about how the cells divide equally and typically result, when they divide, they result in two genetically identical daughter cells. Cells divide for growth, repair of tissue, and reproduction, and there's certain phases that they go through. And just the fact that it's very purposeful, normal cell division is. There is a table on page two, 361 in your Iggy book. It's table 21.1, the characteristics of normal cells and abnormal cells, so it kind of compares and contrasts. It's good to review that so you kind of understand what happens when there's a benign tumor cell and a malignant cell, the characteristics of that, and we'll talk a little bit about that more in the next few slides. So again, um, just a visual to kind of help you understand the difference between normal cells and cancerous cells. As you can see here, this is that normal cell division um, versus this unorganized, kind of chaotic, running amok cell division here. Um, the regular shaped nuclei um, that is smaller than the cytoplasm, and this one, as you see in a cancerous cell, the nuclei is larger and typically abnormal in shape. So um, you can kind of go through this. This is how we tell the difference whether the cells are cancerous cells or normal cells. And then you can begin to see how this invades. So here is maybe that risk factor that caused the cells to become cancerous and divide in an unorganized manner. And here's that green piece starting to where that they're going through this fast, chaotic cell growth and see how it can begin to invade the underlying tissue. And this is how cancer develops. These are some definitions of cancer. Uh, of course, cancer is abnormal cell regulation. Just key word here is abnormal. The process of normal cell growth and function are lost and they become unpredictable. So that's how cancer does its damage. Benign, some types of altered cell growth, benign. Benign tumor cells are normal cells growing in the wrong place or at the wrong time as a result of problem with cellular regulation. So they're normal cells, but they're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Benign cells are much like normal cells. They have specific morphology. They have a smaller nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. 
Um, and again, basically, they just are in the wrong place at the wrong time, and they they grow outside of where they should. Um, endometriosis is an example of this. It's a type of benign tuber. The normal lining of the uterus grows in an abnormal place. Other benign cell growth can be in moles that are benign, skin tags, nasal polyps, um, sometimes colon polyps are benign, so cells growing in the wrong place. Malignant cells are much more dangerous. They are abnormal cells that serve no useful function and they are harmful to the normal body tissue. They typically have um, a larger nuclear cytoplasmic ratio, which we just saw a picture of that. They have the ability to migrate because cancer cells do not bind tightly together, so they start to spread, which is the, thus the word metastasize. The, the, um, the word metastasize means the ability to spread and invade other areas of the body. That's what makes them dangerous. One thing about normal cells is they have inhibition, so they have the ability to inhibit this excessive growth. Cancer cells do not. They have no inhibition, so they just continue to grow and grow and grow in this crazy chaotic way. We'll talk a little bit more about the difference between benign and malignant in the next few slides. So this is just kind of a summary of what I just spoke about, the difference between benign and malignant. Again, just another review of those two uh, types of cancer cells. Benign are really normal cells. Wrong, oh, I can't write very well on this thing. Wrong place. Uh, these malignant cells are much more dangerous due to all these characteristics listed here. The anaplasia, the loose adherence, the no contact inhibition, the rapid or continuous cell division, um, these abnormal chromosomes. Uh, that's what makes a malignant tumor and the ability to metastasize so it can spread. Just some more visuals on that benign and malignant. Um, some of this is right out of your book, some of the tables right out of your book just to show you why there is a difference and why one of them is so much more dangerous than the other. See how this one is just, it's a little more organized and this one is just kind of running amok here. These two terms here, carcinogenesis, oncogenesis, are both terms that mean the same. They mean cancer development. They're the process of changing a normal cell into a cancer cell. It's called malignant transformation. So these are kind of the phases of carcinogenesis or malignant transformation. Initiation is kind of the exposure of the normal cells and then they d begin to develop into cancerous cells. Initiation is an irreversible event that can lead to cancer development. After initiation, a cell can become a cancer cell if cellular regulation is lost. If growth, con growth conditions are right, widespread metastatic disease can develop. So basically, carcinogens, if the normal cell is exposed a lot to carcinogens, then the initiation process can take place. Carcinogens are chemicals, physical agents, or viruses that um, if the cells are exposed to carcinogens a lot over time, the patient, the initiation process can be more likely to occur. So these are things like smoking, the environment, pollution in the environment. Some viruses are thought to cause, be cancer causing, we know that H. pylori bacteria has been linked to gastric and um, GI cancer. So different exposures to these are called carcinogens that the patients are exposed to that helps in the development of cancerous cells. Promotion is the enhanced growth of the initiated cell by substances known as promoters. So we have carcinogens that um, provide a good environment for the development of cancerous cells. And then we have promoters that promote this thing to happen. So once a normal cell has been initiated by a carcinogen and is a cancer cell, it can become a tumor if its growth is enhanced. 
So hormonal changes, body proteins, insulin, and estrogens can be promoters. So it has to be this um, perfect environment, essentially, for these cancer cells to develop and become malignant. Metastasis occurs when the cancer cells move from the primary location by breaking off from the original group and dis establishing remote colonies. The additional tumors are called metastatic or secondary tumors. So it's important to note that the site that it begins at, so if we have a patient who develops a colon cancer, uh, that is the primary tumor. Sometimes those colon cancers will, will metastasize to the liver. It's one of the most common sites. The patient doesn't have liver cancer, the patient has colon cancer with metastasis to the liver. Uh, because that's a secondary site. So it's just kind of how it's, um, how we kind of gauge what kind of tumors are growing, things like that. Once the tumor is now in another organ, it is still the cancer from the original altered tissue. Another example, breast cancer spreads to the lung and bone. The patient still has breast cancer and it's in the lung and bone now, so it has metastasized. It's breast cancer that has metastasized to the lung and bone. Patient does not have bone cancer. They have breast cancer that metastasized to the bone. Because that's, we need to know that because that's how we treat it. We treat it as a breast cancer that has metastasized. So this picture is straight out of your book. This is um, just kind of the steps of metastasis. And one thing to note in here, basically the important thing that occurs in metastasis is this um, blood vessel penetration. Once the tumor has gotten down into the blood vessel, the cancer cells um, can now break off for the main tumor. Enzymes on the surface, surface of the tumor cells can now get into the blood vessels, allowing cancer cells to enter the blood vessels and travel around the body. So that's not a good thing. Um, so once it breaks into the blood supply, it can metastasize much more quickly. So and that's kind of how this works. Um, it says cancer cells dump into the blood vessel walls and invade new tissue areas. So new tissue areas have the right conditions to support the continued growth of the cancer cells. New metastatic uh, tumors will form at this site. So that's kind of how metastasis occurs. Common sites of metastasis for different types of cancer are on page 363, table 21-2. It's not important that you memorize that table. It's just kind of a good, good general knowledge to know. And the important thing to note is if somebody is diagnosed with a breast cancer, oftentimes they will go ahead and scan the bone, the lung, the liver, and the brain because those are common sites of metastasis just to see if the cancer has spread. So that just kind of helps you understand when somebody might be diagnosed, why we would go ahead and scan other areas to determine whether it has metastasized. And that's how they choose which area they are going to scan, like a CT scan is what I'm talking about. They choose that area knowing which are the most common sites of metastasis for that type of cancer. Review um, cancer grading and staging in, in your book. Uh, basically, these grading scales and staging scales have been developed in order to determine the degree of malignancy of a tumor to, to kind of to form a common diagnosis table so that it's understood like how much the the cancer has metastasized, what kind of cells they are. For instance, the grading scale is kind of more about the cellular part of the tumor. So like a grade one, it means that the, the tumor cells are differentiated and they, they closely resemble a normal cell from where they started it's a low grade of malignant change. As opposed to grade four, which means that they are the tumor cells retain no normal cell characteristics. Um, determination of the tissue of origin is difficult because these cancerous cells are so abnormal. So grade one is a little easier to detect and treat. Grade four is a little trickier. Um, staging determines the location of the cancer and its degree of metastasis. Um, so if you look, look through that staging table in your book, st uh, stage one 
is uh, less metastasis, a less degree of metastasis than stage four. four stage four indicates that it's uh, um, more of a met metastatic cancer. So basically, you don't have to memorize these, but you need to know if somebody says it's a stage four, grade two. Mm, so so it's that means it's metastasized if it's a stage four. Grade two would tell you that the cells are somewhat abnormal, but we can still kind of tell where they came from. So just kind of review that just so you can have a conversation with somebody about um, you know what what these tables mean and just what they mean um, and why why we do why why they're staged and why they're um, they're put um, graded and a lot of that is helps the doctors and the providers to determine the treatment so the degree of metastasis and the degree of um, change in the cell determines the type of treatment and that's why they use it one thing I want to bring up um, really is that our goal in as nurses and educators health educators in the community our goal and our job is really to let people know that cancer needs to be found early and treated early. The prognosis is so much better. So um, in the next few slides, we'll talk about um, our, our role as a nurse and in teaching. There are lots and lots of tables and charts and the chapters assigned for this module. Um, different ones that I like the best. There's one on page 364. It's class classification of tumors by tissue of origin. I like that one because I've used that through the years because basically the tumors are named after the tissues they typically, um, the tissues of origin. And a benign tumor is usually ends in OMA, O-M-A. A malignant tumor is a carcinoma. So in for instance, a, um, an a, a epithelial gland, so these are oftentimes in the lungs, the adenocars, the uh, ad adeno, adenomas. Sorry, I'm having trouble pronouncing these sometimes. Um, for instance, like an adenoma is a benign tumor, an adenosarcoma is a malignant tumor of the epithelial cells. So it's just kind of good to know that because like if, you know, you look at a patient's chart and look at the history, sometimes you can determine like where the cancer is and if it's benign or if it's malignant just by knowing these terms. Um, another example is um, hepatoma, hepatoma, hepatoma. I know that hepat is referring to the liver. Oma would mean that it's a benign tumor of the liver and it's, um, in comparison, a hepatocarcinoma would be a malignant um, cancer of the liver. So that's just kind of a gem. That's why I like that one a lot because it kind of helps me. If I hear those terms, I can kind of differentiate what kind of tumor it is and whether it's benign or metastatic. Other um, tools that we use are staging and grading. Basically, um, grading is goes through um, just a grade a G through a G4 a G4 being the cells that um, have more than likely metastasized so a G1 would be the least serious cancer a grade 4 would be the most serious so it goes in order 1 through 4 so 4 being the worst Staging of cancer, it talks about um, where the tumor is, if it's where the primary site is, if it has spread to the lymph, and if there's any metastasis. So different ways to kind of grade and stage these cancers. You'll hear this referred to a lot over the years in your nursing career. Typically, um, of course, if you have an M, one, that means a distance metastasis, so that's what it's referring to. Um, and there's no need to memorize this, but just have an understanding that there's a reason we do this. The reason we do this is to determine the extent of the 
of the cancer so that it can be treated appropriately. Just another visual to kind of support the staging of tumors. Again, stage four being the worst because it has metastasized, um, so it's spread to other organs. Stage two is early locally advanced, as you can see where it's getting into the lymph. Um, stage one being localized. Stage zero being where it's what we call in situ. It's still in the original tissue and has not spread. So again, just the difference in what these, these tumor cells would look like um, maybe to the oncologist in, when they're um, staging the cancer tumor. So why do people get cancer? And why do some people get it and some people don't? Um, again, kind of what we talked about in the development of cancer, the um, situation and the environment has to be right in order for those phases to occur. Sometimes it takes years and several, you know, for it to develop. So that's why we begin to talk about risk factors. When we talk about risk factors, they are typically carcinogens that um, if the normal cells are exposed to over a long period of time can pr promote the activation of the oncogene, which is a cancerous cell. And again, lots of tables um, in your book. On page 366, there's table 21.6 that talks about cancer types associated with tobacco use. And that's so the, those um, that tobacco is a carcinogen that promotes the development of lung cancer, oral cancer, um, pancreatic cancer, esophageal cancer. They're all listed there in your table. There's also cancers associated with a known viral origin. So we talked about viruses, sometimes hepatitis B, C, HPV we know is big in the news lately that um, it's a human papillomavirus that is typically sexually transmitted. There's certain um, types of the HPV that can develop into a cervical carcinoma. So, um, so scary and something to be aware of, but again, those are the environments that virus puts that normal cell in an environment where that supports the growth of cancerous cells. We've all heard a lot about, um, you know, we talk a lot about it in the news of just being healthy and being, you know, active and eating foods that are good for us, the omega-3s, the leafy green vegetables, those are thought to promote a healthy environment as opposed to an environment that would support the growth of cancer. Um, you know, there's another table again on page 367 that talks about dietary habits to reduce cancer risk. So it basically talks about avoiding animal fat, minimize red meat, alcohol consumption should be down to at least one or two drinks a day, eating lots of fiber, vegetables, foods high in vitamin A, vitamin C, um, but those seem to promote a more healthy environment as opposed to an environment that is conducive of cancerous cells. Older adults are definitely at risk. As we get older, it puts it at risk, at risk for pretty much everything more so because the older we get the more time we have had on this earth to be exposed to the carcinogen so that's what puts um, an older person at risk. We also know that genetics puts us, um, you know, just our DNA can put us at risk for certain cancers. We know that there are a couple that we're finding a specific genetic chromosome link to it. Um, breast cancer is one of them. We know that there is a significant incidence of colon cancer that runs in families. Prostate cancer as well. So we, we know um, some cancers we, we have actually identified the specific gene so we can test people for it. Other ones we just we haven't been able to identify that gene yet, but we know that um, we have seen in families that, you know, if mom, dad have it, it could put their patient at risk for having it. So things to look at. So really the most important job of the nurse is to teach patients about risk factors and to help us um, identify known risk factors that the patient has and to recommend screenings at the appropriate time and to encourage patients to get screenings, especially if we identify that a patient has several risk factors for a certain type of cancer. 
Um, for instance, we, you know, if we identify that a patient maybe has some bleeding uh, from their rectum, they have a known family history of colon cancer, then it's our job to tell them that, you know, those are risk factors and it sound, you could be at risk for colon cancer. You need to have a colonoscopy to, in order to identify. Because our goal as healthcare providers is to identify early and to treat early. We have to do this because the patient outcome is so much better when we are able to identify early and treat early. The later, the, the longer, and just talking about metastasis and the growth of cancerous cells, hopefully that'll help you to understand why it's so important to stop that cancer when we, as soon as we can um, so that it doesn't have time to invade all these organs and cause damage because the more it's advanced, the more it's metastasized, it is way harder for us to fight. So early identification, early treatment, key in cancer. So screenings become key for the early identification of cancer. So um, again, back to the tables and the charts in your book on 367, seven warning signs of cancer using the letters for caution. And you can look in your book, I won't write all this out, the caution, the C meaning changes in bowel and bladder habits, sore that does not heal, so A, sore, that does not heal. U stands for unusual bleeding or discharge. T stands for thickening or lump in the breast or elsewhere. I stands for indigestion or difficulty swallowing. O stands for obvious change in a wart or mole. N standing for nagging cough or hoarseness. So these are key features that can indicate cancer somewhere that we tell patients to report and have checked out and have regular screenings, especially if they have known risk factors for certain types of cancer. Screenings include things like colonoscopies, mammograms, getting yearly blood tests um, to check your blood count, check for any abnormalities in your blood. Genetic screening becomes somewhat controversial and you've probably heard about it in the news over the past few years. The fact that um, patients are class getting screened and are testing positive for genetic risk factors and having possible like radical preventive medica uh, surgeries done so they're a little bit controversial, some of the genetic testing. They're typically very expensive, um, but some patients will want these done because they have very high risk factors, such as high family history of possibly breast cancer. Angelina Jolie is somebody who kind of sticks out in my mind as far as she tested positive um, for some markers for breast cancer. And her mother, I believe, died from breast cancer, so she had preventive um, mastectomies done. So she went ahead and had the surgery done even before the, the, her, she was identified to have any cancer. So a little bit controversial just because there's no guarantee that those, the testing positive for those genes is actually um, going to develop into cancer. So it's kind of radical preventive surgeries can be the result, which is a, a little bit controversial in some patients. Just a question to review and test your knowledge here at this point in the uh, presentation on cancer development. Be sure to try to answer it and then check to see if you are correct and review the rationale in the presentation comment section. The presentation non-voice has the answer in the comment section. So one more question just to test your knowledge as far as cancer development and care of the patient um, to prevent cancer development, make sure you check your answer in the comment section of the non-voice presentation. So now we'll just talk a little bit about once someone has developed cancer, um, what problems it can cause and how we should uh, provide care for them as nurses. Um, so once uh, cancer develops in an organ and destroys its normal tissues, it can decrease the normal function of that tissue or organ. So that can lead to problems 
such as a reduced immunity, um, sometimes reduced blood producing function. So if somebody has like a leukemia that's a cancer in the bone marrow, that can affect their immune system. It can affect their red blood cell count. It can affect their platelet count. So um, those are just some problems. Altered GI structure and function. Uh, if they have a cancerous cancer growing in the GI tract anywhere, like colon cancer, esophageal cancer. Um, and it can, of course, decrease respiratory function. The decreased respiratory function can come from lots of different things, like a low red blood cell count could, um, you know, decrease their oxygen supply. Any kind of a lung cancer tumor can, um, can affect uh, their, their breathing pattern. So the first part of this presentation talks about the development of cancer and prevention and just kind of screening for cancer. We're going to move on to care of patients who have been diagnosed with cancer. So as far as a patient with cancer in general, there are several common problems that develop with patients who have been diagnosed with advanced cancer. It is common for them to develop reduced immunity and blood producing functions. So think about what this means. Reduced immunity means that they have an increased risk for infection. And then if they have a um, reduced blood producing function, then we are gonna see some anemic patients. So those often occur in a patient who has been diagnosed with cancer. Altered GI structure and function Think about the problems that your patient would develop with that. They're going to have possible malnutrition, possible um, uh, elimination problems, possible um, problems, you know, absorption of specific nutrients, things like that. Motor and sensory deficits. So, oh boy, doesn't that... That makes them at risk for falls. So that we all know that's a biggie. Safety is always the key thing that we're out to maintain for our patients. Typically, surgery is one of the um, earliest known treatments for cancers. Um, these are all the different types of can uh, surgeries that might occur for somebody who has cancer. And you can just kind of review these in your book. You don't have to memorize them or anything, but just know that kind of different things that we might do for treatment. Prophylaxis is somebody, like if we determine that somebody has like a polyp, like I mentioned earlier before, they might remove a benign polyp from the colon so that it does not develop into a cancer. That would be prophylactic. Diagnostic would be a biopsy. That's where if we see a spot in someone's lung that we um, look at a CT scan and think it's probably probable cancer, they'll go and they'll biopsy that tumor to determine if indeed it is a metastatic cancer or a benign cancer. Curative surgery hopefully um, would mean that we could, if there's a tumor available or tumor there, we could actually remove the tumor and cure the patient. Um, palliative surgery. Sometimes palliative surgery is uh, just to, if someone is uncomfortable, we really cannot cure them, but it's more we do the surgery to make the patient comfortable. Reconstructive surgery um, would be maybe following like a breast a lumpectomy. Um, sometimes people who have throat cancer require reconstructive uh, surgeries to remove a tumor like from their neck and then do some reconstructive stuff um, things like that. Uh, reconstructive could also be a bowel re resection with a colostomy. So lots of different surgeries that um, are available for someone for a treatment for cancer. Postoperatively for any of these surgeries, we should, you know, you guys know a lot about postoperative teaching. Um, so you would be able to take care of these patients. Cough in a deep breathe and monitor for infection, monitor for pain. It's all of those things. Um, 
And then there are some additional needs for patients who have cancer undergoing surgical treatment. Of course, there's a lot of psychosocial support. A lot of times, um, for instance, a breast cancer patient having a um, mastectomy, there's a lot of psychosocial things involved in that kind of um, surgery for cancer. It's a lot of body image problems and um, and things like that to cope with. So it's a, it's a little bit different than your typical surgeries because of that. Really, they're going to need a lot of teaching, um, support groups, um, just thinking like perhaps a patient with a, a colon cancer has a colonoscopy or has a, a, a colostomy, which is um, where they they create a stoma and then um, they have to have to wear a pouch. It's a lot of teaching, so that's a little bit more specific um, to a to a cancer patient surgery. So to continue talking about cancer in general, cancer management, um, we have several different ways that we can manage cancer. So let me just kind of put this umbrella thing out there again. I just want to make sure that um, we all understand that the key to cancer management is to identify it early and treat it early. Surgery is an option, of course, if it's a tumor that has not metastasized, that is in an area that we can easily do surgery, we're going to take that cancer tumor out. Um, so it's a common treatment for uh, cancerous and sometimes it's a cornerstone treatment so it's like if we can get it out of there we are going to get that cancerous tumor out of there especially if it has not had time to metastasize yet we're getting it out prophylaxis prophylactic surgery means that um, this little polyp is a precursor to cancer so I'm taking it out we're getting it out because if it's at risk tissue um, we're going to go ahead and get out before it has time to develop into a malignant cancerous tissue. Diagnostic surgery is a biopsy of an area. So it's, um, we talked about that, about that a little bit in maybe biopsying areas of the GI tissue. Um, a biopsy is a removal of a little piece of that lesion and we can look at it. We can look at it under the microscope. We can determine what kind of cell it is, whether it's a malignant cell, whether it's a benign cell. So that's how biopsies help us in the management of cancer. So it tells us what kind of cell we're dealing with and how aggressively we should treat it. Curative surgery means that we can remove all cancer tissue. That's a great thing when we can do that. If we can remove the tumor, get it all out of there, and the patient has um, should be cancer free after that. Sometimes palliative surgery means that we are only removing a tumor for patient's comfort. Uh, we might not be able to keep, to, um, especially if the cancer has spread to other areas of the body, um, we can at times do a palliative surgery for a tumor that's maybe causing a lot of pain. Basically, that means that it's not curative, it's just palliative, it's for comfort. Sometimes after a surgery, we have to do reconstruction. Um, what comes to mind is after a mastectomy, which means the removal of breast tissue, we have to do like a reconstructive tissue for the patient, reconstructive surgery. Um, this can also mean revision of scars, cosmetic, um, especially in head and neck cancers. So um, surgery is very common in the treatment of cancer. You've most likely heard of radiation therapy. Radiation therapy is the exposure to these ionizing radiation beams, these gamma ray sources to treat cancer. Purpose of radiation therapy for cancer is to destroy cancer cells and maintain a safe environment. So key things to know about radiation therapy is that it's localized. So here's that local treatment. So we will take a patient possibly who has, uh, for example, a lung tumor. They will be taken down to radiation therapy. They will be marked. So they sort of um, mark the patient where the tumor is. And they usually do it with a, a marker that is pretty resistant. It's like a um, permanent marker. It's a little bit even more permanent than a permanent marker, if that makes sense at all. 
Um, but they do that because that is where the radiation beams are targeted at um, because these radiation beams will destroy cancer cells, but it also will destroy the healthy cells. So we try to minimize the amount of radiation to the area targeted, and it's a local treatment. The effects of radiation are seen only on the tissues within the radiation path. Um, again, making it a local treatment. Radiation therapy is usually given in a series of divided doses um, for a different cell, you know, and that's going to be driven by what type of tumor it is, where it is. Um, the oncologist will um, determine the number of treatments and um, the orders for the treatments. The important thing for the nurse to know as a patient undergoing radiation therapy is that it can cause some damage to their skin and it can make their skin to that area extremely fragile, painful, very raw. And so educating the patient on care of that that exposed radiation site um, is very important. So we need to teach them that they do not scrub the site with very abrasive soaps. They need to treat it very gently Again, going back to the charts and the tables in your book, um, lots of tips as far as caring for the patient's skin with radiation therapy. Um, a lot of the tips are rinse soap thoroughly from the skin, make sure they don't try to scrub off the dye markings. They have to avoid exposure to the sun um, because that skin is very fragile. They're way more at risk for sun getting sunburn, so um, they should should not get sunburnt to that fragile, fragile skin. It's like baby skin, essentially. Um, avoid heat exposure, wear soft clothing, things like that. So this slide just again lists the teletherapy, which is an external radiation method, and then brachytherapy is more um, where they actually might implant the radiation to the patient. Um, and then, so the patient with brachytherapy is actually hazardous um, and they have to be in certain types of isolation where it's limited who's exposed to the patient. And typically the nurses that go in the room and take care of this patient have to wear lead to protect themselves. They should, they should also wear the, the badges. The nurses that take care of these people should wear the badges to um, determine the level of radiation exposure that they've had. The idea of radiation is that it will limit, kill the cancer cells or hopefully like maybe shrink the tumor that has developed. It can be used in conjunction with chemotherapy. It can be used alone. It could use, sometimes they'll use it before surgery. So they'll try to do uh, radiation for a couple of weeks to shrink the tumor so that it's easy, more easily removed by surgery. These are just a few things that are the side effects. Um, just think about uh, ways to take care of a patient with these side effects. Sometimes like chewing gum, sucking on candy and stuff like that can um, help their altered taste sensations. Fatigue, you know, allow them to rest. Uh, local skin changes. They need to take very good care of that skin and be very gentle with it um, because it's pretty raw, so they should not be scrubbing it. They should use um, very mild soaps and lotions. Don't use lotions that have fragrances and things like that. Those are more irritating. Aloe is a good thing. A natural aloe is good for that. And then like an aquaphor, something that is a more of a healing moisturizer would be good. Um, and usually they're, um, they're either the radiation therapist um, or their physician will give them recommendations as to what they should use for those uh, areas that are kind of irritated by the radiation. Sometimes it can cause some bone marrow suppression. So what that means, think about what that means. That means that possibly they could have a poor production of their red blood cells, white blood cells, or platelets. So think about what that would make the patient look like. Of course, if they don't have white blood cells, they'll have an um, impaired immune system and be susceptible to infection. If they have low red blood cells, they could be tired and anemic. 
and then if they have low platelets, that makes them at risk for bleeding. So just think of all those things. I think this pretty much lists everything that I just talked about in the last slide, but um, just some more things to make sure you point out to your patient as far as care while they're um, having radiation treatments. Chemotherapy um, are, there's lots of different types of chemotherapy. The types of chemotherapy selected for each patient is different. Um, chemotherapy is um, drugs usually identified to kill the cancerous cells um, to stop in, in many different ways. For instance, anti-metabolites um, are thought to decrease the, the ability of the cancerous cell to replicate itself because it decreases their metabolism, so they lose the energy to be able to replicate themselves. So they, all of them work in a different way, and typically people will get like a little combo of chemo um, so that we can try to kill the cell in a, a few different ways, the kill, kill the cancerous cell in a few different ways. Um, it's much, kind of like the HIV meds that we give. We give a little cocktail of it so that we can um, kind of target different areas of where that, um, where that grows and where that's able to mutate. Um, so we do the kind of the same thing with the chemotherapy. Um, the, you know, the only issue with chemotherapy is as we give them medicines that kill their cancerous cells, sometimes we can also kill the good cells. So there's a lot of side effects that can occur with chemotherapy treatment. So chemotherapy is um, a systemic therapy. So what that means is if we compare it to radiation, radiation therapy is topical. It's um, it is um, focused on one certain area, it's localized. Um, chemotherapy is systemic, which means it can have an effect on all normal tissues as well as the cancerous cells. Um, dosage, again, is according to uh, the physician and how they decide the dosage and scheduling is. Typically, dosing is decided upon by the patient's weight um, and then also the type of cancer they have. And also they try to give the chemo that's going to give them the optimum dose um, with the least amount of side effects. Chemotherapy drugs are typically what we know as vesicants, and they're administered, most of them, there's some that are administered a little bit different, but most of the chemotherapy drugs are administered through an intravenous route. And a lot of them are what we call vesicants, which means they have a, um, a very acidic pH to them. Um, so it requires a central line to be that we infuse them through a central line. A central line is just a line that goes into one of your patient's um, larger veins. Um, if we put that vesicant drug in the small peripheral veins, um, it actually can um, leak out into the tissues and can cause um, what we call an extravasation, which can actually, that highly acidic medication leaking into the tissue can cause um, a very harmful reaction. And I think that's in our next slide. This is a picture of um, somebody who's had a chemical burn from um, extravasation of a chemotherapy drug. So it can actually literally burn the tissue that it leaks out into. That's why we have to have um, um, special nurses, um, any, a nurse who administers chemotherapy has to have special training and certification. Um, and that's because of just these big side effects and these big um, safety concerns with administration of chemotherapy. Um, but it's just important that we know why they have to have a central line. The other thing that a central line allows us to do is do frequent blood draws and, and things like that that we need to do for these patients too. We're probably checking their blood counts frequently. We're checking for the effectiveness of the chemotherapy frequently. So with a central line, you can draw blood off of it. And those are the porticasts that are um, implanted in the patient's chest. It could be a PICC line as well. Typically it is a porticast because they're a little bit longer. Um, they last a little bit longer than a, um, a PICC line does typically. 
So just make sure you're familiar with the terms extravasation and vesicants. Vesicants just means that it's a highly pH, highly acidic pH um, medication that we should not administer through a peripheral IV site. Extravasation just means that the, um, the chemical has leaked out into the patient's tissues. Again, you have to, like I said, typically nurses who administer chemotherapy are highly, um, highly trained and they have a certification for administering the chemotherapy. Um, and they have to wear special protective um, equipment in order to do this. Um, it's really important to think about how this makes your patient feel. Um, when a nurse comes in holding a drug that, and they're all garbed up, but yet they're administering it in someone's veins. So it makes them a little bit uncomfortable, but it's important that it gets explained to them what's going on, uh, why we're protecting the, the nurse from exposure to the, the chemotherapy. Um, there's lots of uh, uh, precautions that a nurse would have to take also if you are taking care of a patient who just had chemotherapy. Um, there's precautions that um, typically 24 to 48 hours after the last dose of their chemotherapy that a nurse has to follow. Typically, that's like double gloving and just basically you are protecting yourself from being exposed to any other bodily secretions because that could expose you to the chemo. I want to encourage you to look through um, your module uh, topical outline and uh, those looks at those different classifications of the chemotherapy um, drugs and kind of review each classification, kind of how it works. There are some topical chemotherapy meds as well, um, to, but to, there are oral chemotherapy meds where they might um, actually just take a pill, but the, the majority of them are actually... Um, of IV, which need to be administered in a central line, but just review each of those. Kind of look at the, uh, kind of look at the classifications of them, and just kind of look through. I encourage you to look through your Sylvestri book to look at um, any kind of nurse alerts regarding any of those types of medications. So, um, along with chemotherapy treatment, becomes a lot of side effects because, again, we're actually killing some of the good tissue along with the bad tissue. Um, you, typically, they'll do an induction therapy with chemo, and what that is is a really um, intense first few weeks um, dosing them up pretty good with the chemotherapy to completely kill um, the cancers. So the side effects are pretty high. It's pretty harsh on the patient to, to go through like that uh, induction therapy. Think about, just look at these side effects and think about what your patient looks like. Neutropenia means that their neutrophils are really low, so that puts them at very high risk for um, infection. So think about nursing care related to a patient who's at high risk for, inpatient, for, for infection. Make sure you um, could take care of that patient. Impaired clotting, they're at risk for bleeding. That's a big deal. You got to make sure your patient's safe and doesn't fall, especially not fall and hit their head. Um, if they fall and hit their head, they're going to be at risk for a big head bleed. And think about what that patient would look like. A lot of nausea and vomiting that can lead to dehydration. Think about a patient that you would uh, that's dehydrated. How you would help that patient? You know, fluids. Um, you know, monitor their lips. Make sure they have some um, some chapstick, things like that, to kind of help support them, and give them fluids as allowed by their their medical diagnosis. Alopecia, they're going to lose their hair. That's a body image disturbance. I think how you would support them with that, give them referrals to places where they could get wigs, etc. Um, mucositis means that they're um, a lot of times the mucous membranes in their mouth is affected by the chemo. So they're at risk for getting like fungal infections in their mouth and that causes a very sore tongue. Sometimes they can barely eat with this stuff. So it's, we need to get a meds to treat that and then get them non-irritating um, foods that they would be able to eat that wouldn't irritate their, um, their sore mouth and sore tongue. So like hot foods would not be um, ideal for them. Anything very, very cold might not be the best thing either. 
Um, so just think about all these different things. This is just a slide that kind of um, describes how chemotherapy can work um, against the cancerous cells and can work to treat a patient who has been diagnosed with cancer. This is just a list of um, those medication categories that um, I told you to make sure that you kind of review. Probably a good place to look these up, like I said, is your Sylvester book because the Sylvester book is really good about pointing out the highlights of what you should know about each of those meds listed on your topical outline. The following slides are just, again, some questions for you to um, just practice answering questions about cancer. Um, I encourage you to try to answer the question first and then look at the answer that is posted in the PowerPoint in the comments section. This concludes uh, the presentation for Nursing 150 for care of the patient with cancer.